It's Monday, March 20, 2023. A cold one it is. I woke up, it was minus 22 C outside. I'm uh, anxiously awaiting warm enough temperatures to bring the bees out and that is not what that is. It's way too cold. Somebody was asking me last night, well, what do I wait for? And I've, I've talked about this before, but there's no magic formula. Um, I'm a kind of guy who wants to quantify things to, you know, I don't want to do things by how I feel. So I need kind of some numbers to look at quantification and, and keep myself on track and, and, you know, operating from a baseline. So when I'm looking at uh, spring temperatures for the eventuality of bringing my bees out of the barn, and uh, this is based on the fact that those bees are in a four degree uh, building. It's a constant four degrees, no wind chill, uh, or anything like that. And they are not wrapped for winter conditions. They're not wrapped for cold weather. <clears throat> so just uh, remember that that's what we're dealing with here. So what I need to do is I need to make sure that the outdoor temperatures are conducive to that kind of situation. Uh, we're not talking about colonies that are wrapped for winter and have, have an insulation around them and whatnot. Uh, what we have is just, just regular seven eighths wooden boxes with uninsulated lids three-quarter inch plywood uh, lids. I, I do have the uh, Reflectix um, foamy, if you want to call it. It's that foil, kind of a shiny foil bubble wrap thing just under the cover. I think that does help. Uh, I've been told that that helps. Uh, experienced beekeeper, beekeepers have told me that that helps. So what I wait for is I look at the forecast and I look for nights that are minus 10 or warmer. So nights that are not colder than minus 10. I'm talking C here. Um, but the other thing what I need is, is uh, some warmer days for some flight because I'm really looking for the cleansing flights for the bees. Taking them out into the cold weather is not going to do them any good at all as far as longevity and and uh, and ability to build up and everything, but they need those flights. So what the situation is right now is we're really in that transition period where the nights are still, uh, you know, some nights are cold, but coming up in the next couple of weeks, the nights are starting to be minus 10 or warmer. Uh, so that would say, okay, you, you can move the bees out. However, the daytimes are only one, a zero and one, hardly two in the daytime. So that really doesn't do the bees any good because first of all, that's even colder than what they have in the building. And, uh, and then they're subjected to those colder overnights. So that will stress them more and they won't get that flight in you know zero and one degrees so that's kind of where I'm at and I know things can change you look at a, a two week and a, and a month forecast they actually put forecasts out for months at a time and I'm no fool <laughs> they it's half the time they can't tell you what the weather was yesterday let alone a week or a month out so honestly in years past my decision to move out has been made a day or two in advance of moving out. Uh, I'll just keep watching that forecast every day and then one day I pull the trigger and out they go. Uh, another dynamic there <clears throat> is I'd like to move them out on a colder day. It doesn't have to be really cold but if it's not sunny it helps because uh, when the sun starts shining on the ground it gets awful muddy and difficult to move around and it makes a big mess too. Uh, so I'd like to have, I'd like to have zero or minus one and overcast that day. And so if I can find 
that day that zero or minus even even one and overcast would work if i can find that day with the next day being you know three or four or five and sunny that's best case scenario but uh, it's just a game it's a waiting game and and a, a game of of conditions and sometimes it's not the last year was not the right conditions I, it took me two days to move out because uh because it was so muddy i i couldn't keep working i got to a point the first day i had to stop because i couldn't move around anymore it was so much mud uh, so i finished up the next day i got at it early so the ground was frozen ground was was firm and even at the end of of moving them out that day it started to get pretty greasy and difficult so that's the answer to that in my mind and uh, so today it's minus 22 outside working in the wood shop and this is what i'm doing here today a unique feature of my migratory covers is the fact that uh, this this end cleat here uh, I wrap it this around the end of the plywood so that means my plywood needs to be a little bit longer and then I need to run run a rabbit in here uh, ignore this this was a mistake I had to trim this so this is not normal that's not normally what I want to do I think I got that rabbit a little too deep here and that leads me into what I'm doing today so these are my end cleats and so I'm going to take three quarters of an inch off here. And <clears throat> normally when I build my covers, I take a quarter of an inch in. So that adds uh, half an inch to the length of the actual plywood. And that gives me a cover that's, that's technically the same length as my box. So these, these end cleats will fit snugly down the side of the box. Now I'm building for this customer. It's the third year I've built for him. He chooses a uh, one eighth more space in there. So in the past two years, I've made the plywood an eighth longer. And that's not a really big deal, but when I'm building covers for him and I'm building covers for myself, uh, I have to keep the two uh, cover materials separate. But a little light bulb came on the other day for me and I realized that I'll use this little ruler as an example so hold this up so my cover would would extend uh, I can't see the ruler but it was then a quarter of an inch here into that cover into that end cleat uh, so he wants an extra eighth so I thought instead of making the plywood different uh, than the you know what I would call standard I would just simply back that off a sixteenth that'll add a sixteenth to each end equally an eighth equaling an eighth and achieving the same thing and also this end cleat is uh, two and a quarter tall mine are two inches I just cut them I took cut the top cleat two inches I cut the end cleat two inches. So what this means is the only specialty part I need to make is, is this, this end cleat instead of uh, the cover material as well, the plywood. So that's what I'm about to attempt here today is to cut a 3 16th deep, 3 quarter inch wide uh, rabbit in all of these, all of these uh, 400 end cleats here. I did them all up and I wrapped them all and then I realized, oh, I gotta mill those again. <laughs> so I have to unwrap them and mill them. So I've got my dado blade set up here. I've got my auxiliary fence. So it, it hangs over the edge of the dado blade. Dado blade is set to larger than three quarter and it doesn't matter how much larger, but it's larger. I've measured from the outside of the dado blade to the fence for three quarters of an inch. That'll give me my width. And then I've lowered the blade down to less than three sixteenths. And I'll just sneak up on that measuring, measuring that as I go 
to get that just right. As far as material usage goes, here's one that's got a little tiny bit of a knot. I'll run my I'll run my rabbit right there for a couple of reasons. Uh, this part from here to here and across the top, you'll never see. So if there's a blemish at all or whatever, you can put that blemish on this top. And plus the fact that I'll get rid of a lot of that knot with my rabbit. And so just kind of get rid of it, leaving the bottom part as a nice strong piece of wood because that end cleat does take a bit of damage or a bit of uh, stress uh, and it can easily be damaged. Sometimes people climb on my covers and tell them that they're not rated for that, but <laughs> they do anyway. I don't have a tail sawyer, so you can do that job over there. All right, I'm going to try this. I'm going to turn my air filter on. It's Friday, March 24th, 2023. This is the end of my day, and I'm wore out. I had a kind of a big day planned, but there was a wrinkle. There was a wrinkle. Remember the remember the wrinkle last week? I went in a ditch. Um, well, I didn't go in a ditch again, but um, there was a wrinkle with my truck. <laughs> uh, I think I jinxed myself. His buddy was telling me about uh, he was having to replace the water pump on his truck. And uh, he said, wow, big job. You got to take the whole front of the engine apart. And it's cost him over, well over $1,000 to do it. And all that kind of stuff. And I said, wow, that's a lot of money. 
water pump in my truck is held in with two 10 millimeter bolts and you know half an hour and you're done and well so I got to you know it's a good thing I knew that because I had a big day planned of deliveries again not to Winnipeg but outlying stores whatnot uh, you know one town 30 miles away and then pick up a bunch of stuff another town 20 miles away kind of thing so I got an early start and it was a good thing too because I got almost to the town 30 miles away and the water pump packed up in my truck <laughs> packed up in my truck and it, it uh, I think the bearings go out in it and, and then the, the belt comes off and then you can't you can't steer and you can't stop <clears throat> you can stop but you know again you can steer but it's just really really hard um, on larger trucks like that the power assist on the brakes is not vacuum uh, controlled it's hydraulic controlled it's called hydro boost and or hyd hydra boost hydraulic boost hydra boost I think it's called uh, it uses hydraulic pressure off the power steering pump so when the belt comes off no power steering pump pressure no uh, brake boost so you can stop but boy you have to get behind it you really really heave on it so that happened a couple miles before I got to an auto parts store. So I rolled in there and went in and said, hey, you got a water pump for my truck? And he says, yep, hand over 130 bucks. And he handed me a pump. And uh, so that's the pump. And so it's a pretty simple thing. You can see how the bearings go out, it starts doing that. So it just rides on the back of the serpentine. And then the bump part is on this end. And then two 10 millimeter bolts going there <clears throat> it's really quite easy and another nice thing about this system is it has a you can't really see it but in here it's a it's a rubber uh, it's a seal it's kind of like an o-ring but it's not round it's square and it fits in that groove and uh, so you got no gaskets to deal with because water pump problems is always you know clean it up and get gasket sealer and put the gasket and don't mess up the gasket and get the gasket on make sure it's sealed and tight and everything and then the gasket leaks anyway well not so with this one so the actual changing of the pump part is easy there's not very much space in there though to reach down in there so it took me a long time and uh, changing the pump was you know kind of moderately difficult and not too bad and uh, so I got that changed but getting the belt back on was quite difficult the nice young man at the uh, see I'm old so I can say that nice young man at the auto parts store came out he's just going to lunch he comes up and he helps me get that belt on just to pull it on the last pulley and did that um, I actually had taken some coolant with me um, because I was kind of suspecting something like this I had a little bit of leakage and I was wondering hmm is that pump going out <clears throat> and so I put the antifreeze in it and did my deliveries and but I'm doing my deliveries to stores now my shirt's dirty and my hands I've looked like I've been working on a truck I did clean them but you can't get them perfectly clean you know your fingernails and stuff <laughs> so I had to tell my story to everybody just so they knew you know I wasn't just disrespectful and showing up there with dirty shirt and dirty hands so that was my day and I had you know probably 10 or 12 stops to make and so I did and I got almost all my stops made I ditched one of them I decided you know not not necessarily because of my day but I just decided that I was going to go a different direction and and I ditched that stop for now so went to the lumber store picked up a little bit more lumber because I'm running out uh, with my project I need to uh, finish up a few things and uh, yeah I didn't get that much shop time this week I'm really feeling the pressure on that got a guy coming here tomorrow to pick up some work that I've done for him it'll be nice to get paid so that's really good and yeah so I'm gonna go in and spend time with my wife and relax and rest and hopefully I get a good night's sleep because I need it I am wore out I am wore out so anyway thank you for watching I hope you enjoyed the little bit of uh, wood stuff that I put on here it's kind of a short video this week and I wish you a really great weekend take care stay safe and have fun